Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show. Um, call us whatever you want. You do it all. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're all those things, whatever you want. We're online and we're here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. That's a guarantee. Um, the show is free and open to watch, um, as are our recordings. The show is recorded every week, and they're also posted on our website afterwards. And we do a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, book reviews, interviews, demos, uh, basically anything library related we are happy to have on the show. We do bring guest speakers in sometimes, and sometimes we do have just Nebraska Library Commission staff on. And this morning, morning we have Library Commission. Uh, presentation. Uh, strategic planning in a nutshell is our topic for today and next to me is Richard Miller, uh, Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Hello Richard. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and he's been actually, strategic planning has been a big deal, well big deal everywhere I would say any time, <laughs> but recently in the last couple of years in yes. Nebraska major changes have had been happening for our public library accreditation standards and many changes come into effect, um, strategic planning being one of those new things. Right. And for the last month or two, I don't know, Richard's been traveling all around the state um, doing this uh, strategic planning workshops. That's correct. And so we decided it'd be great to have him come on here <clears throat> and give us a um, snapshot of that. Um, yes. The actual workshops are three hours? Three hours. So we're not doing that. Nobody we're panic. doing the Reader's <laughs> Digest version this morning. That's why it's one in a nutshell. Yeah. So this is not a three hour workshop, but this is you know, condensed to the, you know, right. what we've been doing. Um, so Richard's going to take us through what we have about public library accreditation on our site. Um, now I know we know from our registration list and who's here that are there are many of you that are not Nebraska <clears throat> people, which is great. Um, some of the things you'll hear will be specific to our to our libraries and Nebraska and Nebraska accreditation. But strategic planning in general is it's you know it's standard for anybody, right? I it's mean, universal. So all of that re those resources will be useful to anyone. Um, but just be aware when we're talking about things requirements and whatnot that is specific to Nebraska. Right. Check okay. in with your states to see if you have something similar. All right. Other than that, I will hand it over to you, Richard. <clears throat> Take it away. Well, Krista said we have some people from out of state as well. When we looked at the registration, we have people from at least 10 other states. So welcome. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Uh, and as Krista said, this is aimed specifically at Nebraska, but we will talk about strategic planning and the steps involved in it. However, the way we're doing strategic planning is uh, it's kind of a, a simplified version. This is not a full-fledged strategic plan that you might do using something like planning for results, for example. What we're going to be doing is we're talking about doing strategic planning based on needs that you identify in your community and then responding to those community needs, not library needs. Notice I said the difference there, community needs. Now, Krista was nice enough to send out a link to this agenda, we're not going to have this agenda up here, but I do want to run through the agenda with you to let you know what we'll be talking about. And I do want to add one thing to the agenda toward the end if we have time. Uh, first of all, wish me happy birthday. That's my birthday today. Oh, that's right. It is Richard's birthday. So, happy birthday, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm glad to share that birthday with all 34 of you, however many are on here. So glad you're here. This is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about how the strategic planning works in relation to, as Krista said, our accreditation guidelines. If you're interested in more information on our accreditation guidelines, you can find that on the website, which we'll be looking at. Uh, I think they're good. We had a task force put them together about uh, three and a half, four years ago. They're really an excellent improvement over the old accreditation guidelines, which weren't bad, but these are much better. And you might be interested in looking at those. So after we talk about that connection between those two things, we'll talk about community needs. And for those of you who have sat in on any of our three-hour uh, sessions on strategic planning, which either I've done or I've done in conjunction with a system director in one of our four systems, we uh, hit people over the head with that. They have to underline the word community needs because so many plans that, that I read and that other people read from libraries talk about library needs. That's not the emphasis of strategic planning. The third bullet there says the word strategic comes from strategy. They're both three-syllable words, but you'd swear that strategic makes the word more complicated for some reason. But what we're going to talk about is how 
the concept, concept of a strategy built into strategic planning really helps you, we hope, in your position within the community when funders are handing out money or you're making the case for improving the library. <clears throat> Is there rat poison in your future? For those of you who've sat through any of the strategic planning I've been doing, I'm going to tell a story about rat poison in libraries, which I do tell, and it's probably getting old since people have heard it for at least three years, but I, I, I hope, oh, well, good. Well, well Kristen, we'll get, all right, now, good. So. <laughs> well, um, I think it will, I hope, open up your mind to thinking differently about what the library might do in the community. And then the next line has to do with the library as an investment in the community. And I make the case, whenever I'm with uh, village boards or city managers or city councils or library boards, when they ask questions like, well, why should we put this money into our library? It just costs us. We don't earn anything from the community. Well, first of all, I, I would say that if you're a good real estate agent, for example, that if you have people come to town and you want to try to entice them to buy a home, what you do is you show them the schools and you show them the recreation services and you show them perhaps their, the churches that respond to their particular need or, or other things. And I would bet that almost every good real estate agent makes sure that they take them by a library, especially if it's a good library in the community. So in essence, a library is an investment in that community. It's part of the quality of life. Uh, it's part of the educational process and so forth, and, and I think smart real estate folks know that and show people their, their libraries. We're going to talk about seven required elements of a strategic plan. What we have told people in our planning processes are that they don't have to necessarily follow the planning or the strategic planning process that we're going to give them. If they already have a strategic plan that is of recent vintage, meaning in the last three years, and it has the seven elements that we'll be talking about, then they're probably in good shape. However, a lot of our communities, and we have a lot of, of quite small libraries, don't really have a strategic plan. So that's why we go through the steps. We'll give you a strategic plan process in 12 steps. And the thing I'm going to add after that, if we have time, is we're going to look at, an, at a sample strategic plan from Morwell Public Library, which is in the extreme western part of the state. It's eight miles from the Wyoming border. It's got 921 people. Um, it's a small community. Uh, we have smaller, of course, but and it's a short strategic plan, but it, it meets, uh, I would say, nearly all of the elements that we want to see in a plan. And then we'll give you a chance to ask questions. Of course, mm -hmm. as Krista pointed out, you can ask questions as we go through here. Yes, I'm not type going... in your questions and you want. I am willing to interrupt as needed. <laughs> okay. Well, we're not going to keep this, this up here because you should have received that ahead of time. I ask you to print it out ahead of time so that you'd have it on the side. When we do our three-hour strategic planning, we have a copy of the strategic, uh, excuse me, of the agenda in the front of the notebook, but we also have a, a free copy that's not hole punched and put in the notebook that they can just set aside and follow along. So I hope you can follow along. If you get lost, type a question or we'll, we can always go back to this if we need to. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to talk about a few things first before we go to this strategic uh, plan in 12 steps because <clears throat> there are some points that are made during the longer workshops that I wish to go over with you. Um, we talked about the first two on the agenda which had to do with strategic planning and its relation to library accreditation guidelines and we talked about community needs versus library needs or other needs. Uh, the word strategy and strategic. Um, I mentioned earlier that I thought that the word strategic somehow is harder for us to understand than the word strategy. If we think of our plan as a strategy, as something we can use in the community to make the library's position stronger, it's sort of, um, it's not really intuitive, I would say. Mm -hmm. But if the library can do a better job of meeting the needs of the community, in a sense, it meets its own needs better. And that maybe should be straightforward, but I can almost guarantee you that most of the plans that I have read from libraries before we ta started talking about strategic planning were really things such as, we have X number of kids who come to the summer reading program, we want to increase that by X percent. Or, we don't have enough people using our library, we're going to 
uh, bring more people in by doing X, Y, and Z. Do you see how that's all internally oriented? Whereas if we say something like, <clears throat> all right, we have a lot of latchkey kids in our community. Here are the facts. Uh, of our, in our community, 85% of the families have both parents working. And so from 3.30 until 5 or 5.30 when the parents get home, these kids are without supervision. They don't have a lot to do in our community. Maybe that's something that the, the public library can address. That's, that changes the orientation from the external, uh, from the internal to the external, so that you're actually uh, responding to community needs. And that will endear you to the community leaders. So let me talk to you about rat poison. Uh, some years ago, when I was living and working in Missouri, I heard a story about the St. Louis Public Library. St. Louis Public Library is a large metropolitan library. They have multiple branches. I don't remember how many, probably around 12 or 18, whatever it is. And the city of St. Louis, for those of you who have been there, you know it's a river town. It's right along the river. It's an old uh, city. It looks like an eastern city for the most part. Um, there's a lot of old structures in the town, although it's done a lot of rebuilding lately. And some years ago, they were having a rat infestation problem in the city. So the city decided that the thing they wanted to do was to distribute rat poison to the citizens at large and let them put it out to help with the rat problem. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole debate about how dangerous that might be or whether it's a good idea or not or the environmental aspects of the whole thing. The point that I want to make about the whole thing is that when they decided they, that the best approach they could use to, is to distribute rat poison to the community at large, <clears throat> they looked around about how they were going to do that. Well, all the city offices that might do that are open naturally from 8 or 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Most people in the community are working till 5 o'clock. So what do they do? How do they distribute that rat poison? Now, I don't know how this came about, but it turned out that the multiple branches of the St. Louis Public Library became the distribution points for rat poison. Now, that's hardly a traditional library service or something that they would do, but what's it doing? It's addressing a community need. So I hope that you take this story to perhaps expand your view about what the library might be doing in the community. It might not be traditional library service, or it might be something in conjunction with other entities or other agencies that deal with the same community need or community issue. So remember rat poison if you remember nothing else from the presentation, and maybe <laughs> it'll help you expand the view of how you do strategic planning. I already talked about investment in the community. So let's go to uh, the website first of all. Uh, here. There you go. Yep. Okay. If you look on the Commission's website, this is the page that you'll be brought to if you put in the word planning in the search box or anything else. And this is what the website looks like. Can I expand Ooh, this a bit? Sure Let's expand it. <laughs> For those of you who have not been to the Nebraska Library Commission website, whether you're in the state or not, I, I suggest it's a really good resource. The way this works is that it has fly-out menus. If you hover on the left-hand side here, you'll notice the menus fly out from there to the right. Well, the one that we're going to be dealing with is accreditation and certification. So the way you get to this page that we were looking at here is you go down to library accreditation, and you can look at about library accreditation, and then you can go down the page and go to strategic planning and public library accreditation, which is the page we're going to be spending a lot of time on here. So let's look at that. At the very first part of that strategic planning and public library accreditation, before we get into the rest of the page, which has example plans, which has other information, forms in uh, Word documents that you can use for the process, we're going to go to the top here. Because I mentioned earlier <clears throat> that if you already have a strategic plan that is no more than three years old, and it has all these seven elements in it, then you're probably in pretty good shape as long as, a pretty, as it's a pretty good document. Now, we work with our four regional library systems in the state, and each of the directors in those four systems is willing and able 
to evaluate or to give you a critique of any strategic plan that you have that you plan on sending into the Commission for approval. The connection again with public library accreditation is that as part of the accreditation process which takes place every three years for public libraries, they must have submitted a strategic plan to me at the Commission which is then approved. Often I will look at those strategic plans and send back recommendations for changes or say you got to make these changes or this is missing some elements in the strategic plan. If your strategic plan wants you to get a look at it and you're um, try to look at it critically, if it has these elements in it, then you're probably in pretty good shape. So send it on in, we'll take a look at it and uh, evaluate it. Now one of the things that uh, we're going to be doing starting this year is that for those of you who are not from the state, the accreditation process happens this way. We send out uh, emails on the 1st of July to every public library that is up for accreditation or reaccreditation in that year because we take a certain number of libraries every year. It's split into three different years. <clears throat> when we send that to them, they have until October 1st to send in and complete their public library accreditation application form which if you're interested in seeing a sample, that's down here. We're not going to go into that today. But they're also, they also have to send in and have approved before October 1st their strategic plan. Now this year there were about 55 libraries that were up for accreditation or reaccreditation. It took a lot to get that done within the time period. We had some slosh over beyond that too because there's you know, it might take some time to redo a strategic plan or there are some mistakes in the public library accreditation application. So um, I was worried because next year there are almost 90 public libraries that are up for reaccreditation. And I didn't know how I was going to get it done. And Scott Childers, who is the uh, system director for the Southeast Library System, came up with a brilliant idea, why I didn't think of it, I don't know, mm -hmm. that the strategic plans you don't have to wait until July 1st to send in your strategic plan to get it approved. You can do it any time. So any time up until July 1st, up until October 1st actually, those public libraries that are up for reaccreditation or those libraries that are currently unaccredited and wish to become accredited can send in their strategic plans either to their regional system director for a critique or directly to me if they wish to for a critique and I'll send back information if there's some deficiencies in it. So that's the idea Scott came up with and I thank him for that. That's going to take a lot, I think, off my plate at least come July 1st through October 1st. Here are the elements that need to be in your strategic plan, at least these. There has to be a library mission statement. If you're interested in mission statements, we're not going to be talking about that today, but we have some samples in the documents below that you'll see which you can look at. We have the sample mission statement from the New York Public Library, which is about one sentence long. Uh, I uh, suggest to you that if your mission statement is too much longer than that, it's probably too long. I know we get mission statements in that are several paragraphs long. That's not a mission statement. Uh, you should be able to memorize and, uh, your mission statement so you can use it in your elevator speeches if somebody asks you, what do you do and what's the library's purpose and all that. It has to contain a community profile, and we'll be talking about that today. The community profile basically is, hey, what are the demographics of your community? And in addition to demographics, what are the things that make that community tick? And you'd be surprised if you have not done or looked at American Fact Finder, for example, which is the U.S. Census Bureau's uh, user-friendly interface to census data. If you haven't looked at the census data recently for your community, you should do that. I mean, we've got the 2010 census. That's pretty darn recent. And you might be, you might have some surprises in there. Then, number three here, it says you need to do an assessment of the community needs. And uh, that again, we're hitting people over the head with community needs. If you have anything written down, underline community needs so that you see that all the time. And number four, you need to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the library and the opportunities and threats outside the library. Now, over the last several years, I think this was uh, our CE coordinator, Laura Johnson's idea, and I really like it, is that uh, separate those two. This is what's called the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. 
But I've don't. Heard of that, yeah. Yes, you have. <laughs> Everybody's heard of the SWOT analysis, but don't do that straight through without separating it into internal, external. You're going to analyze the strengths and weaknesses inside the library. Then you're going to look outward toward the community and analyze the opportunities and threats outside the library itself. This has the advantage of doing a couple different things. One is that if you do strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and you do it all together, the strengths tend to get confused with the opportunities and the weaknesses tend to get uh, confused with uh, the weaknesses. Is that what I said? Weaknesses and threats. Yes, that's what I meant to say. Okay. So it's better to do it this way, and it does help you look internally and then look externally when you're looking at uh, the community itself. Then you analyze those things that you found, and you'll see we have a form in here that you might be able to use. You analyze what this all means in the steps two, three, and four that you've gone through here, and where the library can contribute to community, the community itself. And I'll come back to that number five in just a minute. Then you develop specific goals and measurable objectives, and we're going to talk to you briefly about SMART goals and what those mean and how you write actually uh, measurable objectives or SMART objectives is what we really should have called it. And then finally you come up with a plan for how you're going to evaluate whether you have met the goals and objectives that you put together for your strategic plan. It's cyclical. It's never ending. You don't have to necessarily start at the beginning with step one and so forth and so on, but it is a handy way of doing that. So those are the required elements of a strategic plan. If you think you already have one, that's it. If you're in Nebraska, please, from other states, don't send those to me. Contact your state <laughs> library agency. I'm sure they'd be happy to help you. But uh, we can't really evaluate strategic plans from outside the state. All right, let's talk about the strategic planning process in 12 steps. And which one? This one? Thank you. Chris is so helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we were kind of kidding around calling this your own personal 12-step program, but that has some <laughs> jokes that you may not want to make. But we did come up with 12 steps that you might use for the strategic plan itself. And let me show you that it goes down one more. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to be switching back and forth from this list of 12 steps to some of the documents on our website. And Chris is going to tell me that's this one over here, correct? Yeah. Okay. We're going to be looking at this. Uh, this also appears on the website, so you can look at it. And there's a connection here between these 12 steps and the worksheets and the how-to guides that appear on the chart on that same page. When we've been doing our strategic planning, our three-hour strategic planning, we have been doing a shortened form of it, and you've got an even more short form of this whole thing today because we're doing it in one hour. But we have uh, not made people use all of the forms on this thing. But you might want to look at all the forms just to see if it would be helpful to you. Today we're cutting that even shorter. So the first step would be to establish a planning team and set the meeting and work schedule. And we're going to be looking at worksheet number one, uh, plan to plan and at the how-to guide called the planning team. So let's do that. Let's go to those on this chart down here. The chart has worksheets on the left and how-to guides on the right. So for the first one on establishing a planning team and setting up a work schedule or a meeting schedule, first of all we have a nice handy plan in here which you can open and it looks like this. All of these documents that we have on our, on our uh, website are Word documents, so you can use them, fill them in, change them however you want to. You might not want to say Nebraska Public Libraries if you're from out of state. But here is uh, a work plan, a plan to plan form that you can use. You're going to put dates along the left-hand side which correspond with the planning step and you're going to list the team members that are actually going to be involved in that planning step. And the next three columns I get kind of a kick out of because you have a start date and then two columns to the right a finish date, but then reality sets in, your target finish date, um, and then your actual finish date. So I think that's what happens often with planning. And then a review date when you do as, as part of the evaluation. Now, one of the things that... Um, you need to do, and we'll see when we're talking about SMART goals or SMART objectives, is 
that you need to identify either by title or by name of the person who is actually going to be doing and being involved in these planning steps. If you list steps that are going to be taken for your planning process and nobody has assigned that responsibility, guess if it's going to get done? It is not. And probably what will happen is the library director will do it all. If your library director does this whole plan and perhaps the library board is involved in the whole plan and nobody else, you probably aren't going to have a very good strategic plan. You need some input from stakeholders in the community. You need to involve some other people. It's often very good to get some educators involved because they've been doing planning in their sleep for years and they're often very good about following sort of steps, step-by-step -step procedure. So this is the plan to plan form, which I think would be very handy for you to use. Now let's go to the how-to guide, which says for the planning team, here is a suggestion about who you might involve in the planning team. We suggest anywhere from 5 to 12 people. In many of our smaller communities, if they get 5 people together, that's going to be maybe what they can get together. We do warn people, and I don't know how strong the open meetings law or public meetings laws are in other states, but when you're doing this sort of thing, a public library in Nebraska should involve no more than 2 board members if it has 5 board members or if it has seven board members, no more than three library board members, because otherwise they have to declare it a public meeting. And these really are work sessions to do a, a planning. So maybe made up, the planning team might be made up of library staff, board members, community stakeholders. In some communities, there's a feeling that perhaps if you have multiple staff in the library, that perhaps the library director might not be involved in this. That's your choice. In many of our public libraries, that is the only staff maybe in addition to one part-time person, if, if that. A stakeholder is a person in the community that has an investment or share or an, or an interest in something and will be a good member of your planning group. Don't get somebody in your planning group who doesn't care about the library or who doesn't care about the community. That's a waste of time. It should be diverse. If you have everybody on your planning group uh, being the same age or gender or uh, or race, and you have different races represented in your community, you're not being diverse enough, you need to get other people involved. These people need to act as a team. Um, they have to be, uh, they have to use the consensus process to do this. This is not a debate, this is not a voting process, this is a consensus sort of thing. And there's just a little definition of consensus there that says it does not mean that everyone agrees, that the solution is the best of all possible solutions, but it does mean that everybody comes to a consensus that, yes, they can live with that. So that's the how-to guide on that particular step. All right. Let's go back to the, and I want to go back to this. I want to go back to this one. This one. Okay. Step two. Complete the community profile using American Fact Finder or other sources. I mentioned American Fact Finder earlier. If you have never played with this, please do. It's got, it is loaded with information and it's really easy. All you do is put in the name of your community, like Shadron City or whatever kind, whatever is the name of your community, and you can find some great information there. Not just um, things on population, but commuter times for people who work. Uh, the percentage of families and the number of families who have both parents in the workplace. Um, just any number of things. It's really a wealth of information. Now, here's something that will be a great relief to a lot of people. If your community has already done a community survey that is something like a quality of life survey, use that. That has wonderful information in it. If it's been done within the last three years, that's really good up-to-date information. As a matter of fact, we often tell our libraries that you probably want to stay away from a survey. Writing survey questions, administering a survey, and then accepting the responses to the survey and interpreting those are a real skill, a real art. But some of our communities have done that. We have especially been interested in smaller communities that are able to stuff a survey into the local uh, electric or gas bills, where they have their own electric or gas company in town. 
We had one small community that did that. It had an 80% response rate. That's almost unheard of for a survey. But, you know, they were able to get it into everybody's home, and it arrived with something that everybody looks at. So, you know, if you want to do a survey, that's not a bad way of doing it if you have that opportunity. Number three, gather information from the community. We're going to talk about various ways of doing that. I already talked about surveys. You might use focus groups, interviews, um, observation, and worksheet three, which we'll go to now, does talk about that. Let's go down to worksheet three. I'll go down and click on the question. Yep, sorry. A little slow. It's my birthday. I'm a year older. <laughs> <laughs> it's not you. It's, it's the computer. No, it's an operator. Okay. So this, again, is a Word document. Here are some suggestions about ways that you might do this. You might use this form to organize those, how, you're, how it is you're going to do this. Um, if you're going to have focus groups on our web page, we have about a six-page explanation of how focus groups should be done. Pretty complicated but it is something you might wish to look at. A focus group tends to be a group of people that you want to ask questions about in a particular area. They may represent a particular group that you'd like to talk to. Young parents, uh, older citizens, uh, new uh, people coming into the community, business people, local government officials, you name it. It's kind of a focus group. You're tending to focus on a particular group because you want to ask them questions that you think might be useful for your planning purposes. A key informant interview. Now, we're not going to be going through the key informant interview today other than I want to tell you that a key informant interview tends to be a one-on-one -on -one interview. That is, you choose a person who you feel would be a key informant, somebody who's in the know in your community. And we have an example of the responses to a key informant interview process that was done in what we are calling the Bookville Public Library. We changed the name of the library to protect the innocent or the guilty, but they are actual responses. I also changed the names of the people involved so that you wouldn't recognize who they are. But a key informant can sometimes really be offer interesting points of view that you may not agree with, but that's not the point of a key informant interview. You're getting their point of view. In the Bookville Public Library interviews, what they were doing is they brought people together, they brought people in to talk about economic development in the community and what their point of view was. They brought in people from uh, economic development, they brought in people from job service, they brought in other people to find out what their view was on uh, on. Uh, job development and economic development in that community. I think I recommend that you read that. It was very interesting and somewhat disturbing what they heard. Survey. Um, this says in here, and I probably should take this out, that if you're going to do a survey, attach a copy of the survey questions with a compilation of answers. I don't need to see that. I'll take that off that form. And walking around, observation. I kidded with people that if I ever retire, I don't know when that'll be, but if I do, I'd love a job as kind of a secret shopper type person who goes into public libraries to see what kind of treatment I get and service I get. I think that would be a wonderful way of, you know, somebody from out of town or somebody who's new to the community coming in and see what kind of service they get. That would be very interesting for the planning group to hear about, I think. So that's an idea of something that you might wish to look at. All right. I'm going to keep this community needs up here because we're going to go to that on the next one which says record community needs on a frequency list and this same form here community needs goes on to a page two that I want to show you so that's why I didn't take it off here now I don't know about your community but in the training that I've been doing I've been saying the following and I've had agreement in every one of the training sessions that that we've done what you're supposed to do on this sheet is that when you are attempting to find out what the community needs are, you have to push them to tell you what it is in the community that bugs them or what's positive about the community or what do they think they'd tell somebody else uh, if they tried to entice them to come to the community. And almost 100%, if you ask them the community needs, they'll say something to you like, 
I wish we had more books on. And you have to say, no, 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 no. I, I don't want you to comment on Not potential library. library needs. What are the community needs? What are things in the community that really stick in your craw? Are they real positive? That you're not telling them. Yes. Tell us about us, our library. Yes. Like, no, that's no. exactly what will happen. And Teach for those, them to think outside the box. That's for right. You. And for those of you who know, what happens is that if you ask people about the library, they almost always say, I need more books or I need this or whatever. So you have to push them and say, no, 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 community needs. And almost every community, and people either laugh or shake their heads when I say this, these are usually the top ones. I don't like people who let their dogs run loose. People aren't keeping their property up. People don't scoop the snow off their sidewalk. That's a gripe I have in my neighborhood. <laughs> um, I feel the pain. Yes. People are not keeping up their property. Um, you know, th those are the kinds of things that come up. And what you will find, going back to something I said earlier, if your community has done a recent quality of life survey, those are the things that probably came to the top there. Now, the, the difference with this page, which, which is a frequency page, is that you need to take all those things that you've heard and you need to put them in frequency order. What have you heard the most in the community in terms of gripes or praise or anything else? Um, what have you heard the second most? What have you heard the third most? One of the ones that often comes up that I fail to mention, which I, I'll bet I'll see head shaking out there if I could see your heads, is that, you know what, there's nothing for kids to do in our community after school, or even more frequently, kids, get, kids go off to college and they don't come back here because there's nothing for them to do. There are no jobs. I hear that all the time, and I mm -hmm. bet you would hear that sort of thing too. So that's what you do in terms of the frequency list. The reason for doing this is not just for the sake of doing an exercise. The reason is for the following. What we're asking you to do when you're doing strategic planning is to find out what are the biggest needs in the community, looking at this frequency chart, and deciding which of those needs the public library is in a unique position to address, either by itself or in conjunction with other entities or individuals in the community. And that's where we get back to rat poison. I would bet that none of you have a rat infestation problem, although I don't know that. But it's open your minds. This might be some stuff that you might plan to do that you haven't done before or that is not traditional for a library to do. Remember also, when I mentioned earlier, that this is not necessarily a comprehensive strategic plan. It might be but it probably will not touch on all the services that you offer in the library. In fact, it likely will not. But what it will touch on is those things that the library decides to do, either in terms of programs, services, collection, cooperative ventures, collaboration with others, whatever it is, those things the library decides to do become part of this strategic plan that is responding directly to needs that have been identified as of high interest and importance in the community. You are responding to community needs. You're not going before your funders and saying, we need more money for blah, blah, blah. You're starting out your pitch saying, we have identified or you have identified in your quality of life survey or wherever, or we have found in, in demographic information from the census that these needs are, uh, are of high importance in our community and in the process of identifying those and wanting to respond to those, these are the needs that we have for our budget to do that, either above and beyond the base budget that we have, or we're going to reallocate within our budget, or whatever the story is. But you're letting the needs in the community drive your decision making, and that makes the plan strategic. There's a strategy involved. It's there's not just, where it in. there's <laughs> where it comes from. It's not just going back to the same old, same old. Okay? I feel like I'm doing a sermonette here. I almost feel like that when I get to that point. But I, I think it's really important. Anybody have any questions or thoughts or comments, type them into your question section on your GoToWeb at our interface, and we can uh, expound on them. All right. Let's All get we back. have so far is a few happy birthdays for you. And then someone saying thanks for the information that they've got the excellent resources. Yeah. I think the birthday thing was a cheap shot. I probably shouldn't have <laughs> put it out there, but that's all right. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the 12 steps again. We are, uh, we did steps three and four. We just went over those. Then 
Here we get to the SWOT analysis in 5 and 6. The first one, step six, uh, 5, has to do with determining the strengths and weaknesses of the library itself. So we're going to look at worksheet number 4. Worksheet number 4 is entitled Take Stock. This gives you a working document if you wish to use it. Again, you don't have to, but it has some suggested topics that you might want to look at when you're looking at the library's strengths and weaknesses. You might look at human resources, that is, your staffing. How about your facilities? Are the ADA accessible? What kind of shape are your mechanical systems in? Do you have a breakdown of the HVAC every summer? Do you have an HVA? Do you have a? Do you have a, a air conditioning? How about technology? What kind of shape are you in in that, in that regard? How about funding? Whatever the funding is from. What are the strengths and weaknesses? Your collection. You can break it down by sections if you really feel you want to get that detail, or you can have overall strengths and weaknesses of the collection. The services, the programs and outreach, operations, governance, anything else that you think of. These are just suggestions. These are Word documents. You can change any of those, delete any of those. List honestly the library's strengths and weaknesses. Ask people on the outside if you're a little bit wary of doing that. See what they say. And that's the hard part. The that's part, the hard honest part. part. Yeah, honest. Honesty. Don't just put down things that praise you. Really be honest about what your weaknesses are. Then, once you do that, you go on to step six, which has to do with opportunities and threats outside the library, and this is the same worksheet here, of course, and we've recommended some uh, topics or areas that you might look at. What about the economy? What are the opportunities and threats? Now, those people who do this, I've heard a number of people say this, and it's really true, that if you identify a threat in the community, let's suppose that you identify that um, that internet access in the community really stinks. Well, immediately you could say, oh, hey, That's there's a potential you opportunity. Totally You'd right also now. say, under opportunities, internet access stinks because you're thinking in the back of your mind, well, you know what? We can help with that in our library. Or if we can't currently help, then we need to put that into our strategic plan to be able to help. And that could fall under, under technology, I guess that's what I said. How about the economy? The economy's going to hell in a handbasket. The last grocery store left. A tornado went through town and we lost um, XYZ. Okay, so that may be an opportunity. It's certainly a threat. How about the social climate? Do you have people who are supportive of what's going on or what city government wants to do or what anybody wants to do? Or is everybody saying, I'm for myself. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care about my property. I don't care to be taxed, etc. How about community relations? What kind of uh, relations do you have? I've been to some small towns where I'd swear it's the Hatfields and McCoys shooting at each other. Just, you know. So those are opportunities or threats that might be there. And what else might be? So that's that form. Use it. Might be useful. You don't have to use that form, but it might be useful for you. Okay. Go back to this again. All right, we did five and six. Number seven, determine which community needs the library chooses to respond to. I don't think I need to hit that any harder. I hit that in sermonette number one earlier. But notice the word community needs is underlined. If you get nothing else out of this besides rat poison, that's community needs you need to get out of this. So number eight, write goals and measurable objectives for the library under each community need. We're going to show you Worksheet 5 in just a minute here to show you, and then the How-To Guide for Developing Goals and Objectives, and I'll go to both of those. So Worksheet 5, Develop Goals and Objectives. Here's where we talk about SMART goals, but as I said, no, 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 wrong one, I'm sorry. First this, uh, in your own mind, this, is, this may be a form that you would use when you're saying, okay, community need number one, two, and three. In the workshops, I have the people on their paper circle the word community, community, community at the top. Because otherwise they're going to put down the library needs to improve its collection in blah, blah. So community needs. So if it is, for example, that there needs to be more economic development in the community and we need to help local entrepreneurs learn how to be better business people, that would be a community need. What's, well, okay, wrong. That would be a goal. Community need would be something like uh, business development in our community is lacking. 
The goal could be help local entrepreneurs grow their businesses. And then you could have measurable objectives under that. In each case, list the community need first before you get to the goals and objectives. In that case, I don't think it makes sense to write the goals and objectives before you list the community need up above. You're going to see if we get a chance to look at uh, Moral Public Library strategic plan that there might be a little bit of a mix-up between what is a need and what is a goal and what is an objective, but they didn't do too bad a job on it. And then we're going to go to the uh, develop goals and objectives, and here's where you find the SMART goals, which should be called SMART objectives. And I'm going to go over this briefly. The, uh, your, your objective should be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And I want you to add one thing on there, add a W at the end of it, which is who's going to do them? <laughs> and I mentioned that earlier under the planning process, so who's going to do them? Take a look. We're not. We're running out of time here, so I'm not going to spend too much time that's on okay. that. That's okay. If we need, <clears throat> excuse me, if we need to run over a little bit, that's no problem. We'll go until uh, we're done getting through everything. So just to be aware, people, we may go past our official 11 a.m. Central right. Time um, ending time. Determine in step nine how the library will follow through on these goals and measurable objectives. How really very carefully how it will do it. Now we have on our website a summary sheet which you can use if you wish to. Um, use that for putting and structuring your strategic plan. You don't have to use it, but it appears at the very bottom here under Strategic Plan Summary. Again, it's a Word document which you can use uh, if you wish to. Um, the start date of the planning process, the end date, the members of your planning team, summary of important demographics, socioeconomic, geographic, etc., cultural characteristics, Summary of the community needs and desires in priority order. Summary of the library profile and including the library strengths and weaknesses and the external opportunities and threats. A list of goals and measurable objectives for the planning period in priority order and a summary of the projected evaluation. If you look back at the seven elements that need to be in, those seven elements are kind of built in here as well. So. Back to the 12 steps. Evaluate how well the library did in meeting the goals using the measures uh, set out in the objectives. And that's worksheet number six, evaluation. I'm going to go to that. Come on. Worksheet number six, evaluate the program and projects. Who's going to be on your evaluation team? Is it the same one that was on the planning team? It might be good to get a few other people involved who are, can be objective. What are you going to evaluate? And you have to go then to the objectives, the goals and measurable objectives, because if you do not uh, have measurable objectives, you're not going to know if you get there. What is the purpose of this evaluation? Is it just to do it because the commission said you should do it? Or because it's a good thing to yes. do with planning? No. How are you going to use this evaluation and what questions will the evaluation seek to answer? Now this little box at the bottom I want to uh, talk about for just a minute and I want to add a question when we get to the very end here. You'll notice it says, what do we wish to know? What are the indicators of how we will know if we reach that? If your objectives are written in measurable means, then you will know whether you reach them or not. When is the evaluation needed? Okay. The question I want you to all add, if you have a piece of paper in front of you there, if you don't, add it mentally, is that the most important question in an evaluation, all of these aside, but taking into account all of these, is what real difference did it make? If you cannot answer the question that it made a real difference, then it probably was an academic exercise and a waste of your time. So what real difference did it make? If, if what you do didn't make any real difference, then you probably ought to drop it like a hot potato and look at some other goal and some other measurable objectives for your strategic plan. Now, I want to go to the Moral Public Library strategic plan for just a few minutes. I want to tell you what we have here. I mentioned earlier that we have the results of a key informant interview from Bookville Public Library. You can look at that at your own time. We do have sample community questions, which I think will be very helpful, so I'll go to that for just a minute. If you're going to do a survey, or you're going to do focus groups, 
or you're going to talk to people or have community meetings. These are questions which we were asked for the first year that we did this, which were developed. And I think they would be handy for you no matter which community you're in to use some of those. Take a look at those when you have a chance. Let's go to the moral public. Ah. Oh, I'm okay. Where is it at? Let's go to the moral public library. Oh, you closed the tab of the website. That's the thing. Go to the tab of the go. This one. one? The little box. Where is this it? one? Nope. No. Let me just let me get to this one. I got to do this one. I really am sorry. Yeah, that's okay. That was definitely operator error. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> We're back on the page. Let's go to the moral public library uh, strategic plan. It's only four pages long. But it's really quite good. Uh, the other plans that we have on there, some run 20 or 30 pages. They're quite good as well. But I thought that we'd share this because I think it's a little bit less discouraging to look at one that's a little bit shorter and still has at least almost all the elements involved. Notice they have a mission statement. Notice they did a community profile, which is actually quite detailed. I can tell that they went to uh, the census data because it's all in there. Now. Um, they did uh, some on their own, like a cultural summary. They say they have one swimming pool, two city parks, uh, public golf course, public ponds, stock for fishing, five churches, various community groups, and tells who those are. Then they move on to their SWOT analysis. And they were very good about separating these out for the most part, the internal strengths and internal weaknesses. Notice how they use the word internal and external. That's probably a good reminder. I don't mind that at all. That's, that's a good idea. They talk about having a friendly staff, the fact that they have ADA accessible computers. They don't mention under weaknesses that I don't think the building is physically ADA accessible. They don't mention that. They probably should have. <coughs> they mention that they <coughs> offer several children's programming in conjunction with other entities in the community. They have a new logo. They recently remodeled the library with all the windows being replaced. And I have to check with them because if they recently remodeled the library, perhaps they did make it uh, ADA accessible physically. Under weaknesses, they obviously looked at their accreditation application and at their peer libraries, which they can find on that, and they, f they found out that they are below the average uh, of their peer libraries in local income, open hours, expenditures on collection, circulation, and turnover rate. It's not a bad idea to use the accreditation application and look at your peer libraries and see, because it's already on the form itself, where you lie in conjunction or in comparison with those libraries. Another internal weakness, they, they expanded the parking, but it's still not enough. And then this last one, um, the age of the building, if you look at it, you can see on the picture, the age of the building does make it difficult to expand or to include new areas. Okay, how about external opportunities and external threats? They, uh, the community lacks entertainment opportunities for all ages, but especially for kids and young adults. Um, there's a growing use of technology by older adults, but they need help. Now, this last one looks like it might be library-oriented, but really they could have just restated it and said there's only one free Wi-Fi access in town, which happens to be the library. So they, um, their community needs that they identified are there's not adequate programming and entertainment for school-aged kids. Uh, many families have two working adults. So they have latchkey kids. Young adult population is latchkey also. So the goals, they want to institute a weekly school program to serve the needs of children, establish a teen advisory board, and a research family outreach. Their objectives, they want to write and submit a grant proposal to us here at the commission for a youth grant for excellence. I look back on that. They got a $1,000 grant from us in October 2014, so they met that objective. They want to start an after-school program. They want to talk with high school counselors. Uh, to see about establishing the Teen Advisory Board. Another thing about the Teen Advisory Board, they want to contact other libraries uh, like, and to determine if there's interest in doing uh, movie nights, game nights. They're talking about the local school library, etc. They want to increase the children's summer reading attendance and young adults' summer reading. Community need number two, the lack of adequate housing and the rising cost of living. So what are they going to do? They want to be a source of information for those. They want to establish, um, they want to increase their information on things like housing and reducing the cost of living and have programs on things like budgeting and loans and other topics. And their objectives are 
They're going to research this and purchase some materials for the library. They're going to advertise these new library resources. They're going to contact other entities that probably are interested in these in this goal. And they want to hold at least a couple of programs in 2015, 2016. Community need number three. Here they're addressing the uh, need that they found about the seniors being underserved. They want to establish a kind of miniature bookmobile to do drop-offs at a local home for uh, the elderly. They want to open lines of communication to discover what the needs of those patrons are. And specifically, they want to have technology classes for those people because they identified, remember, a need about uh, evaluation becoming more uh, prevalent among aging people, but they don't know how to use it. Their evaluation is kind of weak. I will say that. They do say that they're going to evaluate. They do say when they're going to evaluate. They could have been a little bit stronger. But all in all, not a bad uh, strategic plan. Quite short, but seems to hit just about all the marks that it needs to hit to be a strategic plan. And I think that's good to realize it doesn't have to be, yeah. like, I think it can be intimidating. It yes. can be huge and long, and what am I going to do, and I can't even think about doing it. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. yeah. All right. What questions do you have for us here? Let's see here. Anybody have any questions? Use your GoToWebinar interface to type them in. We just have a couple of comments from earlier when you were talking um, about uh, oh finding out what's needed in your community. Someone just said, find a need, fill a need, instead of um, hat in hand. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. You said that better than I did. <laughs> yeah. Find a need, fill a need. Um, and then you're talking about goals versus um, objectives. Goals are nouns or goals are verbs. Goals tend to be goals nouns, nouns. Objectives tend to be verbs. verbs. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I yeah, like that. that and action nice. verbs, not yeah. just you want to bring something passive else, verbs. Yeah, go ahead. There. Bring something. Well. I don't care. <laughs> Anything at all. I had, up the, I had up the agenda, but our picture was gone, so. Oh, oh. Just hit one of those others at the bottom. We had the, we had the agenda there. Now oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Any other questions? Um, so, yeah, any questions, other comments, um, thoughts? I know that was real quick. I hope we gave you the essence of the whole thing. Please feel free mm -hmm. to send emails to me if you have any additional questions, if you didn't ask them during the session. And uh, we welcomed all those folks from out of state. I hope this was helpful to you. Yeah, I think it's good that um, oh, we have some comments. Just thank you. And it's a nice refresher for some people who have okay. been doing this. Good. Yeah. I think it's great all the resources that are on the web page. Yeah, look at those. They um, really are excellent. Let's see. Can I go back here? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah, the, I think you, Richard, and um, you guys have put together with the system administrators, I know, a lot of great resources and things that you can use from here to create your strategic plan. All these worksheets and things, I know people have been using them. Yes. And I think it's nice. It breaks it down into just a, point by point. Step Please by continue. step. Step Break by it step. up yeah. into small bits. I know strategic plan can just scare people, and I've, I've heard the comments myself when I've been out and about doing other kind of training. and. Yeah. Um, Technology planning is something that we've done too as well yep. that I have helped people with and people are just like, I don't want to think about that. It's too much. Like, no, you don't have to just work at it and a little bit at a time and you can get through it. What I'd say is about planning is as much as people might think it's painful, if you put the work in up front, it makes your work later on a lot easier. And I'm not saying that mm -hmm. just as a, a platitude or a truism, but if, if you have measurable objectives and you're working with your board to meet those measurable objectives, you really can report to your board and can report to the city when you do your annual report to the city <clears throat> that you have addressed some very real community needs that were identified by community members and you've addressed them and this is what you've done and blah blah you know make your case you're making your case as that one person said earlier uh, you're making the case based on what the community has told you not just based on this internal stuff where you say we want we want yeah, there are other uses, hand, the other things you can do with this plan once you have yeah. it. It's not just, like in our case in Nebraska, I have to have one to get accredited to get those benefits. But then you can think about other ways that it can be used, definitely. It's not just a, um, a one-use item. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I will say about the public library accreditation guidelines are that if you're outside the state of Nebraska, you can't get a live form of that accreditation application because it's only for Nebraska public libraries. However, mm -hmm. Those Nebraska public libraries can look at that 
whether it's live or whether it's a, a sample. We have, if you'll scroll down here, oh no, yeah, let me have that for just a minute. I just want to show them where it is. We do have, if you go back to uh, our flyout menu, um, there is a copy of the accreditation application form here. You can preview the application. And the reason I suggest it is because um, it's a good planning tool. It's a good planning tool because it shows the kinds of questions that you probably should be asking yourself as a library. And there are things like in uh, Section 2 where we're talking about the collection here that really are kind of interesting. I've used this in training where you say, okay, your annual expenditure on materials in this particular case uh, is either, and your peer library figures would be in here in a live one. But in this case, they met all four. But let's suppose your annual expenditure on materials is below that of your peers, yet your annual circulation is higher than your peers. Well, maybe that doesn't mean you need to spend more on your materials. Maybe it means you've done good selection. So mm -hmm. there's some really good stuff in here when it's real uh, figures that we have from the annual statistical surveys that you send in that is really good for your planning purposes. So mm -hmm. take a look at that, whether you're in Nebraska or outside Nebraska. I think it would be useful for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's the end, unless you have more questions. All right. Thanks. Just a couple of comments came in. Um, someone says, I plan to use your web page and some of the resources to update our strategic plan. They are very straightforward and easy to work through. Thank you. And a thank you. This was helpful. I intend to check out your website. Their five-year plan is due this year. All right. Good. <laughs> so, definitely good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Then I think that we'll, we'll wrap that up then for this morning. Does it seem like anybody has any urgent questions at the moment? Right. And that's great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, that is our strategic planning in a nutshell. Thank All right. Richard. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, so that will wrap it up for this week's Encompass Live. It is being recorded and will be available to you um, at some later. Uh, I'll let you all know when it's ready, um, along with a link to this. And um, yeah, just link to the website here um, for resources. Uh, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, using our flyout menu as Richard was, I'm going to go to our Encompass Live website. Um, so thank you for attending this week. I hope you join us for next week's show when our topic is Fun with Friends, Integrating Programming for Adults with Special Needs into Your Library. Uh, we've got staff Amy Wenzel and Wanda Butts from Sump Memorial Library up in Papillion, Nebraska, are going to be here to talk about them, some programs they've done at their library for um, adults with special needs. Uh, so definitely sign up for that and any of our other future shows that we have here on the calendar. Also, if you are a Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so please do go ahead and pop over there and like our page and you will get notifications of when um, reminders are going out, uh, when recordings are available. Right here I did a reminder this morning, people log in right now for the show on the fly, so you'll get updates about the show um, from here on our Facebook page. How about the archives? Oh, yeah, the archives um, for our, all of our recorded sessions are here. Thank you for the reminder, Richard. Yeah. On our Encompass Live, I mentioned that right here underneath our upcoming Encompass Live sessions in the bottom goes to our archive sessions page where all of our shows are here. Um, all the recordings are posted to our YouTube account, but here's where you can get links to all of our previous shows. It will have a link to the recording on YouTube. If there was a presentation of some sort, PowerPoint, Prezi, whatever, a link to that, and any website links that are related to whatever the session was. And we have all of our sessions are here going back to the very beginning of Encompass Live, which was years January, years. <laughs> January 2009. Yes, and they're all there for your uh, watching. We're going to rename it the Krista Show, I think. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just host. I don't, yeah, I'm just here to guide people along. <laughs> so um, other than that, that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time on Bye. Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.